In the late 70s, a sadistic husband and wife team stalked the American West. He would shoot some, he would use hammers to bludgeon them to death, every diabolical method. She was the coldest stone cold killer. Their mission, deviant and depraved. The original plan was sex slaves. Total domination of someone else, to just brutalize, that is what is arousing. What motivated this match made in hell? I thought he was nuts. I thought he was crazy. He's always been that way. She thought, hey, this is a sweet guy. And were they born to kill? I don't think they're sick. I think they're evil. In the late 1970s, California's capital city was a quiet town, notable for its proximity to more famous attractions. Sacramento is really kind of a location that's in between every place else. It's close to the San Francisco. It's not far from the Sierras and the snow. But Sacramento is kind of like a, a little sleepy river town at the time. There was very little crime, really, at that time. But Sacramento's residents didn't realize that evil lurked among them. And in November of 1980, it was about to show its face. I was working a weekend shift. And uh, I got a call from the radio sergeant that said they had some people concerned about uh, uh, one of their friends that had disappeared at a party. 21-year-old college student, Mary Beth Sowers, and her 22-year-old fiancé, Craig Miller, had been attending a celebration at a restaurant in the city. The party was about Founders Day. It was a Founders Day dance and party. And uh, they were here most of the evening. And they were leaving here around midnight or so. They were coming out of the, the carousel lounge. It was a fraternity function. They were in their formals. The kids were coming out of the parking lot right here. Their friend Andy had witnessed their bizarre disappearance. Andy told us that he walked out after Craig and Mary Beth had left the restaurant. And as they were walking through the parking lot, they saw Craig and Mary Beth sitting in the back seat of this blue car. Andy says to his date, watch this. And he climbs in behind the wheel. Uh, OK, where are we going? And Craig says, Andy, this is no place for you to be. As he st started to get out of the car, this little blonde female, tiny petite thing, came running around from the other side of the car, screaming at him. She slapped Andy and told him to get out of her car. Slapped him, got in the car, and they sped off. He had enough sense to jot the license number down on the car. Their friends were worried. Andy didn't recognize the car, nor the petite blonde driver. And Mary Beth and Craig were not the type to behave so strangely. Mary Beth, she's daddy's little girl. Real ray of sunshine, smart as a whip. Loved everybody, loved to dance, loved to sing. Wonderful. She was very pretty. When I met her, she was 17 years old, but she was going on 25. She didn't dress like the rest of us. We were kind of, you know, jeans and t-shirts and that sort of thing. But Mary Beth was always dressed up like, like a businesswoman. Mary Beth had enrolled in Sacramento State University. Excellent student, good in math, good in foreign languages. One of the math teachers said, Mary Beth, let me teach the class, if it's OK by you. That's the kind of student she was. There, Mary Beth had been swept off her feet by fellow student Craig Miller. She met Craig because she was in a sorority, and she met him at one of the sorority fraternity dances. He was a nice guy. He really was. 
the couple's friends were alarmed by their uncharacteristic disappearance. Mary Beth, she was very responsible. I was the careless one. You know, I was, I could have been the one that would gotten myself in a precarious situation. Not Mary Beth. Investigators took their fears seriously. We dropped everything what we were doing, started running the license plates. The vehicle was registered in an affluent Sacramento suburb to a businessman and his 23-year-old daughter, Charlene Gallego. Detective Burchett visited the family house to question them, but was told that neither Charlene nor her husband, Gerald, were there. That's when Gerald and Charlene pulled up into the back. Gerald immediately said, I gotta go, and so Gerald left. At Detective Burchett's request, the heavily pregnant Charlene voluntarily showed him the car in question. I came out right here in the driveway, and that's where she gave me the keys and let me search the uh, car. Couldn't find anything that indicated anything foul had occurred there. And then she got sick, she got ill, and she told me that she was pregnant and she had morning sickness and she couldn't talk anymore. And so at that time, we didn't have much to go on. Uh, so she uh, uh, I had her commit that she would come down and talk to us later. And uh, me and the uh, other detective left the house thinking that we we're going to make contact with them later. Despite what Craig and Mary Beth's friends had witnessed outside the party, Charlene Gallego seemed unlikely to be involved in anything suspicious. Charlene was raised in a relatively fluent uh, home, uh, mother and father, uh, only child, educated. Her dad was in the supermarket business. She was always pretty taken care of. She was pampered. She was daddy's little girl. She lived in a nice area of Sacramento called Arden Park. She had attended Rio Americana High School, which was a good school. She had participated in school activities that included uh, the playing violin in the school orchestra. She seemed perfectly normal. She, uh, she just acted like she was tired and really didn't want to be a part of this, but she was letting me do whatever I needed to do. But Charlene Gallego held a dark secret, which when revealed would send shockwaves across three Western states. In November 1980, Sacramento college students Craig Miller and Mary Beth Sowers disappeared from outside a fraternity party. Witnesses had seen them in a strange vehicle, which had been traced to 23-year-old Charlene Gallego. After agreeing to come to the police station for further questioning, Charlene had failed to show. Detective Jean Burchett went back to Charlene's family home. So we were spotting in the house when the parents returned home. And so we went in the house and we were talking to them about this is pretty serious now, so something's going on, what can you tell us? And while I was there at the house, we received a radio call from El Dorado County Sheriff's Office. And that's when the complexion of the investigation changed. I think this is the spot. This is the site where Craig was dumped. El Dorado County found him face down or in the dirt here, shot several times in the head. He was uh, dressed nicely in uh, his suit, but had no shoes on. And he was just uh, left lying there in the dirt. Charlene and her husband, Gerald, were now the prime suspects in a murder case. And investigators immediately found an address for an apartment Gerald rented. I had no idea what to expect as we were driving out of the apartment. We were hoping he was there because we wanted to talk to him. This looks familiar. There it is. That was his place right there. Neither Gerald nor Charlene were home. We searched their house in detail. It was almost like a prison cell. It was clean. Everything was in order. Remember, there was a gold pan sitting on the shelf. There was bullets and guns all laid out. It looked like he was ready for inspection. Very neat and tidy. It was spotless, just like the car. 
we found guns and ammunition, and, yeah, but nothing really that could connect it to Craig or Mary Beth. Charlene's husband, Gerald Gallego, didn't share the same privileged background as his wife. He'd grown up just north of Sacramento in the small rural town of Chico. Gerald Gallego did not have an abusive childhood. He had a brutal childhood. It was just very, very difficult. Gerald's mother, in her younger days, I think she was kind of wild. She had a lot of boyfriends, brought a lot of men home. Gerald had to deal with a lot of abuse from Henri, bad men. But it was the boy's father, Gerald Gallego Sr., who set the benchmark for bad behavior. Gerald came from probably the most dysfunctional family you could describe. His own father was a murderer. Imprisoned in Mississippi for stealing a car, he vowed to kill the next cop that tried to arrest him. In 1954, Gerald Gallego Sr. took a prison guard hostage and escaped. After spending a day on the run, he then shot the jailer in the head. He was arrested and convicted and sentenced and executed while Gerald is growing up here in California. To have his father removed so violently from the world and from his life with no hope of ever knowing this man and also being identified as the child of a executed murderer would, would have a serious effect on who he thinks he is. By his mid-teens, Gerald and his brothers were firmly entrenched in the family business. They got into robberies, they got into sniffing uh, lighter fluid, they, get in, they got involved in anything they can to, to make a nickel. And soon their misdemeanors drew the attention of the law. When he was 14 years old, Gerald and his brother had gotten a car chase with police and was involved in a shootout. Bullets were coming through the back seat of where Gerald was hiding. Gerald and his brother David were true righteous outlaws. Tempted by the opportunities of the big city, the brothers headed south to the Oak Park area of Sacramento. I knew Gerald, uh, he lived in Oak Park and that's where I grew up at. I thought he was nuts, I thought he was crazy. He's always been that way. They always had guns, you know, wherever they was and whatever they're doing, there was always robberies, and there was always guns in the picture. He was what you might call in the old days a riverboat gambler, making his way through life, cheating other people, and whenever the opportunity came, committing crimes here and there to live. Now, Gerald appeared to be connected with a case of abduction and murder. Attention immediately turned to the whereabouts of Mary Beth. Her boyfriend was found murdered, but she was still missing. So yeah, I was, I was pretty freaked out. Almost on a daily basis, Mr. Sowers would call me and want to know what I've done to find his daughter. And it was so hard to tell him I haven't found her and I don't know what happened. Detectives were, however, convinced of Gerald and Charlene Gallego's involvement in Mary Beth's abduction and the death of Craig Miller but had little evidence to tie them in. This is kind of a roughneck bar called the Bob Les Club. And uh, Gerald worked here as a bartender. This was Gerald's lifestyle, drinking, bars, and women. He felt real comfortable here. We got a call from a, uh, a female that was in the bar. She said he was showing off. He fired, uh, fired a little gun up into the ceiling to get people's attention. And so I went up uh, in the attic and we could see the light. And I started digging around and I found the slugs embedded in the ceiling. Sent them to the lab and they matched them to the bullets taken from the scene of Craig. The bullets were hard evidence connecting Gerald to the murder. Charlene had met her husband three years earlier, but life for this pretty middle-class girl hadn't been all smooth sailing. She'd had some misfortune. She had two failed marriages by the time she was 20, so she was a little bit leery of guys at that point in her life, but a friend had, had uh, introduced her to, to Gerald on a blind date, and it was, that's how they met. 
a couple friends of her wanted her to meet this nice guy and took her to this bar where he was working. And so they, they talked and met and so forth, and he took her home and uh, said goodnight to her at the front door, pecked her on the cheek. She uh, closed the door behind herself and leaned against the door and thought, hey, this is a sweet guy. Within 11 months, Charlene and Gerald had married and moved 200 miles east to Reno, Nevada. Reno, that area was a small town. Um, it's grown tremendously since, but at that time, everybody felt safe. You'd let your children go to things, you know, that children normally go to, to, to carnivals and, and rodeos and fairs and things like that. 14-year-old Brenda Judd had grown up among the small rural Nevada communities. To me, she was like an angel, you know? I mean, she'd always let me hang out with her, and she never told me no. She, she's awesome. She's close to perfect. <laughs> Brenda and her best friend, Sandra Colley, were almost inseparable. Oh, she was a lot like Brenda. They were both very special little girls. They, they weren't the kind of young girls that give you trouble. When they would go somewhere, if they said they were gonna be somewhere at a certain time, they were there. On the 24th of June, 1979, Brenda and Sandra decided to go to the fair in Reno. It was just a year since Gerald and Charlene Gallego had moved to the town. Brenda and Sandra had gone to ride some rides. Sandra's sister says, now be back at the gate at 9.30, because we got to be home by 10. But Brenda and Sandra didn't show up. We all met out there. We called the police. I had overheard my dad talking, and I heard him say something along the lines that they couldn't find her. I had the most horrible feeling. I don't know why, I just... It just scared me to death. Everybody wanted to go look for her, you know. Nobody knew what had happened. No, it was, it was scary. My dad looked at me and he says, they're still alive. And he says, if they weren't them dogs, it'd be howling up a storm. What he didn't know was the night I got home, them, I couldn't shut them dogs up. They howled all night long. The key to the disturbing mystery would eventually lie with Charlene Gallego. Over a year later, the heavily pregnant 23-year-old would find herself on the run with her husband, Gerald, following the disappearance of Sacramento students Craig Miller and Mary Beth Sowers. When Craig's body was discovered, Charlene's parents became concerned for the safety of their daughter and reached out to the authorities. They notified the FBI. They set it up where they would wire money to a Western Union office in Omaha, Nebraska. The FBI staked out the office until Gerald and Charlene came to collect. The FBI took them into custody as they collected the money. In custody, neither Gerald nor Charlene offered an explanation for the death of Craig Miller or to the whereabouts of Mary Beth Sowers. Charlene was nothing like the meek and mild uh, gal I met at her house. I talked to her for several hours just trying to get her to tell me where we could find Mary Beth and she wouldn't give up a thing. With Gerald and Charlene in custody, the search for Mary Beth Sowers continued. We were out looking for Mary Beth every day. She's not dead. No, they'll find her. Yeah, she'll show up. Three weeks after her disappearance, the mystery of Mary Beth's whereabouts would be solved. I was home that night and I received a call from our communication center. So uh, I drove out here, it was dark, late at night. It was that field right out there. You could park down the road and walk in. I walked up, I recognized her dress. I knew that that was Mary Beth. That's where he shot her. 
21-year-old Mary Beth Sowers had been violently sexually assaulted and her body discarded in a shallow ditch. It was just devastating. That's as close as I could describe it. I just couldn't believe it. She was going to get married, and you know, she talked about having kids, and and to be to be brutalized at that at a young age, and that's that's how she died. That's how she left this world. It is just horrifying to me. It would be over a year before the details of Mary Beth and Craig's deaths would be revealed, when suddenly Charlene decided to talk. On the first jail visit, after uh, a long period of time, she said, I guess you wanted to know what had happened, and so she told us. The tale of Mary Beth and Craig's murders was one of sordid premeditation. I'd gone to the Arden Fair uh, uh, shopping center late one night, and they were waiting for somebody to abduct. Craig and Mary Beth are heading towards their car when they're confronted at gunpoint. Gerald orders them both into the back seat. After shooting and dumping Craig out of town, the couple took his fiancée back to their home. They brought her back to the apartment right here. And according to Charlene, uh, Gerald drugged Mary Beth into the apartment, took her straight back to the bedroom, and uh, Charlene was left out in the, uh, in the front room to fend for herself. She laid there most of the evening and nighttime while everything was going on in the bedroom, just listening to what was going on. I can't imagine what went on in her mind. Sick. I mean, who would do something like that? Gerald sexually assaulted Mary Beth for the rest of the night while Charlene lay on the couch. She said that she dozed off and on uh, while everything was going on in the bedroom. And then about the time the sun was coming up, Gerald drugged Mary Beth out of the bedroom, all disheveled, and they took her for a ride. They then walk her out into a kind of a wooded area. He tells Mary Beth to lay down. She lays down on her back and shoots her in the head. After what she had gone through that night, she was probably relieved that it was over. But this shockingly brutal confession wasn't the end of Charlene's story. At that point, Charlene uh, broke down and, and uh, began to cry. I never forget the uh, yeah, mascara around her eyes ran like a river down both sides of her cheeks. She began to tremble. She said, you don't understand. Uh, this wasn't the first time. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, there were others. Charlene Gallego would go on to reveal a diabolical murder spree that spanned two years, three states, and eight more innocent victims. Following the brutal slaying of college sweethearts Craig Miller and Mary Beth Sowers, Charlene and Gerald Gallego were in custody. With Charlene willing to talk, she might hold the key to solving the string of violent murders that the husband and wife had engaged in. It became clear to me at some point that you have to strike the deal with the devil. If you don't, then there's too many other victims, too many other people that go unanswered. Had there been another way to do that, I surely would have loved to have done it, but that didn't happen. Prosecutors struck a deal. In return for her testimony, Charlene would be offered a reduced sentence. But no one was prepared for the horror Charlene would reveal as she took investigators on a chilling tour of the couple's hunting grounds and burial sites. Their depraved spree had begun in 1978, a year after they first met. 
Gerald became impotent. He couldn't perform sexually. He no longer, with her, could have normal sexual intercourse. And so what he was doing is that uh, he was looking for some fantasy that would satisfy him sexually. The original plan was sex slaves. The way he proposed this whole thing initially was he wanted to be able to capture young women, take them to a location where he can keep them captive and use them as he wished. So she's sort of going along with this first, it's sex, it's not murder. Maybe that was what eased her into it. The couple drove to a mall in Sacramento and Gerald instructed Charlene to entice two suitable victims to act as his sex slaves. She identified 16 and 17 year old friends, Kippy Vaught and Rhonda Scheffler. She goes to them and she says, okay, um, we got some marijuana, you wanna go smoke some marijuana with me? Okay, so sure enough, they go out to the van. Charlene opens the side door of the van and there he is with a gun, commanding them to come in at gunpoint and they do and that's, they're caught, they're done. With Charlene driving and Gerald in the back with the young girls, they drove to the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains while Gerald assaulted Kippy and Rhonda. Hours later, they were back on the road. They get in the van and they go out to an area east of Sacramento. They pull into this agricultural area, pull down a road, and Gerald gets out, takes the girls out, gets a tire iron out of the back of the car, bludgeons both the girls, gets back in the car. Uh, they're still moving, gets back out, has a, I think it's a 25 caliber semi-automatic, goes out, shoots both girls. At the heart of impotence is humiliation. And humiliation for men is a source of a great deal of anger and frustration. And the people who most remind him of his humiliation are women. So he would identify uh, women as the people who should be his victims because they're the ones to blame. They leave the victims there in the ditch and drive back to wherever they're staying and clean up the van and so forth. Charlene claimed she had not known Gerald would murder the girls. But Gerald, it seems, had always had a twisted sex drive. He was a good talker. He was smooth. He was like that ever since I'd known him, you know, even as a kid. He thought he was God's gift to women, you know. He'd do anything to get their attention and make them laugh and so forth. And Gallego's pursuit of sexual gratification proved to have no boundaries. Gerald had a daughter, and uh, I know that he was charged with molesting his daughter. He first raped his own daughter, who was very young, and carried on this relationship for some period of time. Most people that are abused do not grow up to be abusers themselves. But those individuals that grow up to be abusers, almost all of them have a history of being abused. Typically, the predator will introduce sexual acts that cross boundaries for the compliant person. His story of wanting sex slaves had to do with trying to get Charlene to go along with this and get her to see that this is for both of their benefit, that this would enhance their sex life, because otherwise he was bored. Here was a classic pedophile who was stuck with the idea that he needed that younger girl to satisfy his perversion. Gerald Gallego would not be satisfied by his first murders, and one year later would draw his young wife into his plans again. I don't think the first two victims, she realized that he was going to kill them. But then you come the second set of victims, the same thing. Um, I think she knew that that was going to happen, but her desire to please Gerald was stronger than her knowledge of what's right and wrong. Charlene's confession would finally solve the mystery of the disappearance of teenagers Brenda Judd and Sandra Colley from the fair in Reno. And she revealed how she had played an active role in the capture of the 14 and 13-year-old friends. Without Charlene, 
it is doubtful Gerald would have been able to abduct uh, these young women. It would have been very, very difficult. But Charlene brought that about because she befriended the girls and put them at ease. And they didn't think any type of danger at all was there. As Charlene drove away from the fairground, Gerald molested the girls in the back of the van. The fact that he abducts two girls at once would it tell me he wants one to watch what he's doing so that he can then move on to her and she'll be in such a state of terror that it will again signal to him what a powerful person he is. The ordeal lasted for almost two hours before Charlene pulled off the desolate highway. As she waited in the van, Gerald took the girls from the back and one by one bludgeoned them to death. I can't even imagine what she went through that night. Angry, extremely angry. He had no right to touch her. I mean, she, she was 14. She was our family's everything. He had no right to steal that from us. Charlene had detailed information about them but she couldn't place exactly where it was they had been buried. We spent considerable time out looking and taking her out to try to find those sites. That was a real desire, was to try to return those girls to their parents. And that was the saddest part, is that during this whole investigation, I was never able to do that. By the time of Brenda and Sandra's murders, the tally of victims had reached four all of which might have avoided abduction, were it not for Charlene. Charlene Williams grew up in a, a well-to-do home without anything in particular that should have signaled that she, there might be trouble ahead. But apparently her parents were hoarders of a sort. They were not very tidy housekeepers, I know that, because they, they had a lot of stuff stacked up in one, in one bedroom. That was a mess. It's not clear whether they also had obsessive compulsive disorder, which often goes with hoarding, in which case, as she grew up, she could easily felt rebellious against the restrictions and the rigidity of a household like that. Because as she became a teenager, she, she did a few more things that were kind of um, not the good girl image that people had expected of her. Charlene had some sort of deviant sexual arousal pattern herself. She was involved in three-way sex with her former husbands and so on. Uh, it didn't really work out, but when she met Gerald, uh, she was very, very willing to go along with this. The Gallegos murders fit a pattern that would be repeated all too often. And Charlene's twisted tour revealed a method of operation highlighting the depravity of their murderous marriage. She walked down here, and when she came to the place, obviously she had some knowledge of where they were buried because she was standing right in a gravesite, and she said this is where they were buried, right here. 17-year-old Stacy Redican and Karen Tweeks were also abducted from a Sacramento mall. She described that everything pretty much took place inside of the van. Charlene was actually in the driver's seat, but she turned around and that uh, originally both girls were naked and that he was going through the process of uh, raping the one girl and the other girl was just sitting and kind of sniveling and crying about what she was seeing happening to her friend and uh, of course believing that she was going to be next. So it had to be a pretty horrific thing for these girls to go through. It had been sure terror to be out here at night. Anything that is involving total domination of someone else, total control over a victim, to just brutalize her any way he wants, that is what is arousing to someone like Gallego. Charlene claimed she was intimidated by her husband and fearful to deny his deviant desires. Gerald, however, claimed that Charlene had been a willing and active participant in the sexual abuse and murder of their innocent victims. 
usually when there's two individuals involved in a sexual murder, one is a dominant person and the other is more like an assistant. In this case, Gerald was the dominant person, Charlene was certainly the assistant, but the assistant plays a role nevertheless. After the first abduction, the first murder, Charlene could have left. She was nothing keeping her there from Gerald. She could have gone, um, but she didn't want to. She chose to stay there, and she was part of this, to, to be sure. And Gerald's insatiable desire showed no signs of abating. Charlene described how in just over a month, she had helped Gerald kill two more women. One, a pregnant 21-year-old hitchhiker named Linda Aguila, whose body was left among the rocks of the barren Oregon coastline. The other was Virginia Mokel, a barmaid from Sacramento, whose body was left bound in fishing twine on the banks of the Sacramento Delta. He had the ability to murder in various ways. He would shoot some, he would use hammers to bludgeon them to death. The young woman in Oregon, he buried her alive, so he used every diabolical method to kill his victims. College sweethearts Mary Beth and Craig would be Gerald and Charlene's final victims, as their abduction led to their arrest. Charlene's information on the total of 10 murders would provide the prosecution with powerful evidence against Gerald. But the consequences of their deal with the devil would leave the public and victims' families outraged. In 1982, Charlene Gallego had turned on her husband and admitted not only to her involvement in the kidnap, rape and murder, of Sacramento students Mary Beth Sowers and Craig Miller, but to the murder of eight other girls and women in California, Oregon, and Nevada. The objective of the prosecution uh, in both Kershaw County th through Richard Wagner and Sacramento County through uh, Jim Morris was to uh, put Gerald on death row and have him executed. That was the, the goal. My intentions as a prosecutor was to see that he was executed for his crimes. I made no secret about that. There is no amount of time that he could do in jail for what he did to all of these young girls and these families. Charlene's testimony allowed the prosecution to secure the sentence they desired. The death penalty was imposed. Couldn't happen to a better person. In return for her testimony and for her part in the abduction, rape, and murder of 10 people, Charlene was shown leniency. She was a very excellent witness and did her job in court telling the truth. And so I, I have no regrets about having entered into that bargain. It's like making a deal with the devil because we know that she enticed at least six of the victims to their death, but at the same time, to try to get Gerald on a death sentence, we all made the decision that that was worth it. Charlene was sentenced to 16 years and eight months. And in 1997, aged just 41, she walked to freedom. That to me was a slap in the face. How do you put 16 years, eight months on somebody's life. Well, she definitely got a whole way with murder. I thought she should have been right along with him. The question over the true extent of Charlene's role in the murders would never be answered. What was certain is that together, Gerald and Charlene were a lethal combination. But did their motivation to commit these monstrous acts lay in their upbringing, or were they born killers? Gerald was not necessarily born to kill, but he was certainly vulnerable to it from a very early age. He had serious disadvantage growing up and then turned and twisted that into a murderous personality. Coming into the world as he did and the family came into, I don't think there's any question but that at some point someone was going to die because of him. 
His father was convicted for murder. Uh, he had a very, very difficult childhood. Now, that's not an excuse or an explanation, but it certainly doesn't help in the development or molding of a serial sexual murderer. Um, the amount of anger and aggression and hatred uh, in inside uh, Galego was just enormous. I believe that Charlene, had she met the right guy instead of hooking up with this character, we never would have even known who she was. Well, I don't think Charlene was a born killer at all. Um, I think Charlene got involved in this through her association with Gerald. Uh, Galego, on the other hand, certainly had a deviant sexual arousal pattern. But I think Gerald would have killed uh, Charlene, no, but Gerald, absolutely. Gerald would eventually die of natural causes before his execution, but not before the bodies of Brenda Judd and Sandra Colley were finally discovered, nearly 21 years after Charlene and Gerald had abducted them from the fair in Reno. It was such a bittersweet thing because it was 20 years, 11 months, and three days from the day they were kidnapped till we got to take her home for burial. Uh, I was really pleased, though, when I was told that they had been found. And in fact, I got a call from one of the girl's mothers, and she said, thank you. And I says, why are you thanking me? I says, I didn't find your girls. So it's a, you know, it's a tough situation. She's still terribly missed. It's been 35 years, but you can take it one day at a time or one minute at a time, but you have to go on. That emptiness in my heart will never go away. Charlene continues to enjoy her freedom to this day. But the legacy of her and Gerald's killing spree lives on with the families that have been left behind. There was never any relief or anything like that, none of that. Closure, whatever you'd call it. Hmm. I'll take it better every day. <laughs>